Hello, I'm John Allure. Before you listen to this episode, a couple of things. These are podcasts from the first season of Who Killed Teresa? They haven't been heard in over four years. They're raw. It took me a while to develop a style. A lot of people like them that way, unvarnished. Others commented that it was amateurish. Nonetheless, here they are, unedited. I haven't gone back and listened to them. I haven't cleaned them up. Thanks for listening. And once again, life isn't fair. Justice is blind and dysfunctional. And some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. This is Who Killed Teresa. Hi, welcome to the podcast. This is Who Killed Teresa, and I'm your host, John Allure. Um, in, a, in a moment, I, I want to uh, round out the, kind of the first phase of these cases by talking about and in, introducing the case of Jocelyn Houle. Uh, but before I do, I just want to address um, the last episode, the last podcast I did, which was actually done last night. Um, I kind of did it um, a little bit rushed. Uh, that was in part because um, I'm working on a project right now. I didn't know how much time, I don't know how much time I'm going to have before I can do this again. So I was um, in haste rushing out product. Um, but as it turns out, I have a little more time. So I wanted to kind of felt last night like an un- incomplete thought, like the picture wasn't completely stitched. And uh, so I wanted to revisit some things. Certainly when you, you talk about these things, other ideas form in your head and you, you kind of want to round out the entire picture a little bit. And as I said, I was kind of in haste to get out the door last night and in doing some, so um, created some confusion that I want to address now. And it's, it's sort of, the, I think, the nature of these things. I think in the beginning when I started doing this, you know, I was... Um, very methodical and some of the some of the episodes were a little maybe a little plodding and ponderous but that was only um in the interest of really wanting to get the information right and not make a mistake and you know you get you, you start feeling a little freer and you want to kind of um not jazz things up, but make things maybe a little more colorful, a little more, um, put a little more zip into things. And lo and behold, you, you do that and you, and you make a mistake. So the make, mistake I made last night is in the middle of the episode, I realized I had one of my, my dates wrong in talking about um, uh, Joanne Dorian. I think originally I had it on my website that Dorian... Um, it disappeared um, July 29th uh, and was found maybe 10 days later in, uh, in August of 1977. And in going last night, I, real, I had reread some documents and realized that for over a year now, that's been wrong. Joanne Dorian disappeared July 9th, 1977. Now, I, I announced that correctly last night um, in, in going over that case, but in, inadvertently at one point in, in trying to tie up loose ends, I said that the other victim, Chantel Tremblay, disappeared on the same night as Joanne Dorian. And that is, that's just not true. And I want to I correct that right now. Joanne Dorian disappeared July 9th. Chantelle Tremblay disappeared 20 days later on July 29th. That's, that is the correct um, unfolding of events in the timeline there. It's very frustrating um, when that happens. I try not to make a lot of errors like that, and occasionally you find little ones um, and you want to go back and correct them. It's And it's a tedious process because not only do you have a... Now I have this business of a, of a vocal record that I have to go back and and correct, but also on a website I have to go and, and correct the information there. And of course a lot of that information is linked. 
so you have to go in and correct the links so that they're right. And then, of course, the whole process is done in two languages. It's on my website in French and English, so you got to change the French links and also all of the, the English information. But um, there it is. Ne nevertheless, that, that happened. But it does affect things. Um, one of the things that it affects, you know, for a long time, I was wondering how in, in such, a, you know, just a little over a week, how Dorian's body decomposed so swiftly. Um, and I was sort of like, well, maybe it's because it, it happened in the summer. Well, no, it's it's because I had the, yeah, dummy, I, I had the timeline wrong. Um, she was she was out in the summer heat in in the very mid summer heat um, for a month. That's why the state of uh, decomposition was so so severe. So anyway, get that straight. Want to move on from there? Um, don't want that um, mistake to linger. But these these things happen. So with that, I, I want to, as I said. Um, round things out here uh, with uh, one final case. And since I haven't said it yet, if, if anyone is joining us cold, this is a podcast about uh, a series of unsolved murders in Quebec, Canada. Uh, the period is roughly between 1975 uh, and 1981, series of cold cases from from that era that we've been discussing and the last one we've sort of danced around jocelyn hool for a while so let's now f fully introduce uh, jocelyn hool so i'm just gonna i'm gonna go to the website and just read the information i have there because it's it's the most complete picture that i can give you and this this one is a puzzler and um, I think as I read this, if you've been following, you will you will see potential connections to a lot of these cases and then potentially none. And the question is really kind of trying to parse out what's connected to what, which can be very, very confusing. So anyway, Jocelyn Houle. 24-year-old Jocelyn Houle was a nursing student from Chicoutimi, Quebec which is to the east of Quebec, um, actually maybe 100, 150 miles uh, from Montreal. Um, the, she's five foot two, 100 pounds, um, and she was traveling um, to Montreal from Chicoutimi with a group of fellow nursing students to study respiratory therapy for three weeks at the Institute of Cardiology in the city of Montreal's Rosemount District. During her stay, Houle was living at a boarding house, the Jean Mance Institute, which was at 6675 44th Avenue. Now, on the evening of uh, Wednesday, April 13th, Houle decides to join seven of her fellow students for a night out on the town. So they begin their their evening with dinner at a, a place called the Barn Cider, which was at twenty two fifty Rue Guy, and then after dinner they decide to go to the Old Munich um, at Saint Denis and Dorchester, now René Levesque Boulevard. Uh, any anyone who knows Montreal um, knows the the Old Munich. Um, it's, it's, it's like an Oktoberfest bar. It's an, or it was, it's gone. It's an umpapa bar. It's, it's where you, you would go and you could drink in nostalgic for, you know, they, they had, um, you know, women and men and later hosens serving you and, and a, a band on stage playing, you know, sort of traditional, I don't know, Bavarian music. And, and it was, but it was really all about the trays of beer and, and and trays and trays and trays of, of beer. Um, I myself spent, uh, I believe it was my stag party at the at the uh, at the old Munich and ended up in the alley behind it throwing up. Um, so that that'll kind of give you 
Um, you only went to the old Munich if, if you wanted to get wasted, really. So um, Hul and, and that's not, I'm not putting judgment on Jocelyn Hul. Um, I'm just kind of putting that out there as a fact. And they wanted to have a night out, out in, uh, on the town and clearly they, they picked the right destination. So this party arrives at about 11.30 p.m. They drink, they dance, and they stay until closing. They leave the club together around 1.30 a.m. And um, they proceed. Uh, the idea is they want to go up the street to um, another bar. So they go, they go north up to, uh, they move the party to um, a place called uh, La Calache, which was on the main drag of St. Catherine Street, just west of St. Denis. Um, and I believe this is the club, it, uh, La, La Calache du Sex. It, it was a strip club. I think it's still there. Um, so on the way up to La Calache, uh, Jocelyn Houl was, was seen walking apart from the group with, with two men. And when the party arrives at the La Calache, um, Jocelyn's not there. So the friends decide to go back to the old Munich to see if maybe, maybe Jocelyn stayed behind, but she isn't there either. So, so then they decide, well, to think Jocelyn must have gone back to the boarding house. But later when they get there, who isn't at the boarding house. She's absent from her classes at the uh, Cardiological Institute um, both Thursday and Friday, April 14th and 15th. And somebody checks in and, and discovers that she hadn't returned home to her parents' place in Shikudami either at the end of the week. Finally, on Sunday, April 17th, Houle's body is discovered about an hour north of Montreal near St. Calix. She's off, found off a, a very rural gravel road called a Range Sank, about eight feet in from the road, lying face down. In a, in a few inches of water. She's found half naked and badly beaten about the face and head, and her purse is lying next to her body. So the, the coroner in Montreal uh, performs the autopsy, and the autopsy confirms that Houle was beaten to death she had a fractured jaw, many facial uh, injuries caused by kicks or punches. She'd been raped, uh, possibly by several persons. The, the, the autopsy denotes a, a, a large amount of sperma, spermazoa in the vagina. And, and Houle was still wearing some of her clothing, including her bra, which was torn. Um, and investigators conclude that who was not killed at the Saint Calix location. She was only dumped there. And I presume that's because there was not a lot of blood on that scene. Um, so with that, um, you know, a lot of questions um, and, and some things we can point out. Uh, so who is a nursing student? Joanne Dorian, who we were discussing yesterday, uh, was a nurse. Uh, you recall at that Cartierville uh, Hospital, Sacre Coeur. Um, and Louise Cameron, the uh, military cadet from Sherbrooke, was also allegedly working up the street from her house on Portland Avenue um, at a hospital. So there's three um, curiosities. And as we've noted before, uh, Nursing is uh, one of the most riskiest professions for a woman um, to be involved in, in terms of um, sexual assault and, and rape. And then just some things about the, the geography of, so where, where was Houle, um, what her, her coordinates in terms of everything else we were talking about? Well... Saint Denis, we said yesterday, uh, uh, if you recall, Chantal Tremblay 
was was headed from the Henri Barassa metro station to her college, Sejep preschool, which was in the Saint Denis area. She didn't arrive there, but that also uh, that environment where the old Munich is is just off Saint Denis, although a, a, a little bit um, further south than. Um, Tremblay's intended destination. And then if we if we talk about, um, you know, the locations where Houle um, was living in the boarding house, it, it's it's in similar striking distance where the victims, um, uh, Lise Amblay and uh, uh, Denise Bazinet were living in the East End there near uh, La Fontaine Park, although considerably further east. Um, and the cardiology uh, um, place where she was um, studying is, is further west of there. But all of that is to say that if, if Houle came for three weeks to, to study um, and, and living in these different places, she was would have most definitely been a commuter. She would have been someone certainly on the night she disappeared and, and certainly in in traversing the landscape of going back and forth from the boarding house uh, to the cardiological institute uh, using the, the bus and the metro slash subway facilities, which means she would have been traveling along a similar corridor as... Um, Chantelle Tremblay, and then we also presume uh, Lise Amblay, who another one who was Lise Amblay, who was uh, beaten um, in, in her backyard coming home to her parents' house after being at a disco, would have also, she might, she might have walked to the disco and then back to her house, but she also could have been using a bus. Um, and, then, and then finally, um, Denise Bazinet, who, who, who disappeared um, from the East End in the afternoon and, and worked at a uh, St. Hubert barbecue, uh, certainly would have been using um, public transit in order to get around uh, Montreal. Bazinet, just remember, was found at St. Jean sur Richelieu, midway between Montreal and uh, Eastern townships. So that's that's a curious commonality with, with the, the victims I just talked about. The other thing that's worth mentioning is the dump site, a hundred miles. Uh, well, it's not it's not quite a hundred miles, um, but it's a it's a one hour journey, Saint Calix, uh, from Montreal. Depending on how you went, um, from Montreal north to Saint Calix is is a is about a, a one hour drive. Um, and and why someone would go that far north? to dump a body so far north. Um, the, the only thing I would mention about that is uh, um, I would note that uh, Saint-Anne-de-Plaines is along the way to Saint-Calix and Saint-Anne-de-Plaines um, is uh, houses the Archambault prison, which at that time was a maximum uh, security uh, facility. I've also been told, although I have not uh, been able to corroborate this, that Saint Calix, um, there was land near there, owned by uh, one of the biker gang gangs, the um, the eighty ones. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's something that's been put forth to me that I haven't had a chance to to, to validate right now. So. I think I think very that's that's briefly an introduction to Jocelyn Houle. Um and, and now I, I'd like to try something um, a little different. Um, do do something a little improvisational here. Uh, I don't know how this is going to work. This could totally suck. I might completely fall on my face. But I think what I'd like to do is, um, we've talked so far about um, 11 victims, and they, they form 
the, the nexus of the cases. The other ones are a little uh, secondary in nature, although they, they do inform these cases. But this is the heart of the matter, what we've discussed in the last 14 episodes. And um, what I'd like to do, let's see if this works. Um, I'm going to walk through these cases chronologically, starting with Sharon Pryor, ending with um, my sister's murder, Teresa Lohr. And I, I, I'm going to describe to you uh, the photos of the crime scenes in each cases. And, and in some cases, I'll, I'll give you an introduction to each of these cases just to refresh what we're talking about. Try to describe what, what I see in the photo. Um, and then maybe, if, if relevant, add some details that I've, I've gleaned from recently reviewing the autopsy reports where I have them. And, and then from, then, uh, from there, perhaps, perhaps I'll offer some of my, my thoughts uh, after going through these uh, 11 cases. But then when we're done with this episode, if this is successful... Perhaps even even better, um, hell, we have uh, people from all over the world lis listening to this, you know. Although modestly, but still, it do have, you know, at any given time, the entire um, somebody in the on the globe, twenty four hours a day, listening to this. Uh, why don't you offer me your thoughts? What do you what what do you hear? What do you see? Uh, in my describing this that maybe maybe we've missed that would be really really helpful in trying to complete a picture here that um, frankly I'm 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 struggling to connect uh, I have some pieces but there feels like there's something maybe trivial and obvious that I'm missing because I'm inexperienced I don't trust law enforcement to connect the dots so I'd really like your help so uh, let's let's start with that and and see how we make out <clears throat> so uh, just just some things uh, some ground rules to begin with we've never really talked about this um, the, these victims range. The youngest uh, that, that we've dis well, the youngest we've discussed so far is Manon Dubay, who's twelve or thirteen. Um, Sharon Pryor's fifteen, sixteen. The oldest is Helen Manast. She's thirty-four. But but on average, what we're really talking about is um, uh, young women, uh, eighteen to twenty-three. Um, all of them. Very short. Uh, the 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 tallest is uh, Joanne Dorian at five foot eleven. But on average, these women are very diminutive. They're five feet, five foot two, five foot three, five foot four, and very light. Uh, on average, they're all about a hundred pounds. The heaviest is Catherine Hawks at one hundred forty-five pounds. So so these are these are all victims who could very very easily be uh, overpowered. So, number one, April 1st, 1975, Sharon Pryor. Recall that Sharon Pryor disappeared from Point Saint-Charles and is found um, in Longueuil, Quebec. And what I see, I see crime scene, um, a lot of snow. Uh, she's lying on her back. The legs are kind of crossed. She's wearing her shoes, socks. She has an abrasion on her right a leg between the knee and the, the ankle, just above the, the sock, which is kind of, both socks are bunched down around the ankles, uh, dressed in, it looks like she's wearing a, a skirt. Looks like her coat is covering her completely over, uh, her clothing is pulled up almost to the uh, upper thigh, uh, and, then, and then the rest is 
covered except for a hand that is exposed. There's a watch strap on the left wrist. The clothing may have been covering her um, by the uh, offender, or that may be the police doing that uh, in a form of modesty because the pho photographers were were close by. Um, very rushed, disorganized crime scene I see in the snow. Um, clothing, it looks like a man's shirt. Um, looks like a newspaper. Two other articles of clothing that I, I can't really identify. They're dark in color against the snow. What are um, Sharon Pryor's underwear are hanging from a tree branch. And again, I, I don't see any, I don't, in this photograph, I don't see any apiaries. I don't see any beehives, although that's what we're told. But a lot of trees, young trees, not, not great big trees, but like small saplings. Uh, the biggest maybe, maybe the size of, of my, of my wrist. So they're, it's like new. It's not, uh, there's some others there, um, as well though, uh, but, but not, not large, maybe the largest, uh, size of my thigh. They seem to be birch bark trees, I think, something like that. And some details from the, the, uh, autopsy. Um, large quantity of sperm in the in the vagina. So again, the possibility of a, a multiple offenders, a possibility of a gang rape. Um, she's been punched with a ring. Her teeth are knocked out. Uh, she was raped. The police believed within 24 hours. Most uh, again, n no blood on the scene. So she was killed somewhere else and dumped here. Uh, autopsy said that she, uh, she was manual strangulation, so strangled with hands. She Apparently the cause of death was she choked on her own blood. A lot of rage in this case. March 25th, 1977, Louise Cameron, again the, the cadet, uh, that sort of military... Um, also possibly worked at a, a hospital facility up the, the street from her in, in Sherbrooke, Quebec. Um, autopsy says lying on her stomach, although the crime scene photo shows her on her back, so she was flipped. Um, I years ago spoke with the uh, person who found her. He told me that her coat was lying over her. So again, sometimes... I, possibly a demonstration of remorse. So we're looking at the, the scene. Um, again, a lot of snow, um, a lot of trees, uh, more trees than at the Sharon Pryor site and, and in an older forest. Although not, it seems to be that the, the side of the road where the body is, which is the, the left or to the, the west side, more mature trees on the other side of the road. And by, by road, I, it's, it's a gravel road, um, completely covered with snow. To the left, it looks like a younger forest. And clearly to the left, you can see on the other side of the maybe five, hmm, six feet away, the, the remainder of her clothes. Uh, she's fully nude. Um, she has a black glove on her left and um, you can clearly see the ligature around her around her neck what is what later was identified as a boot lace possibly her boot lace because her boots were never found um, body looks like it's frozen lips are pursed um, there appear to be black flecks small small like black dots all over her body i don't i don't know if that's a product of the photography no it can't be because we'd see it in the snow too little little small black dots it's, it doesn't look like an injury I, I i don't know i don't know what that is no blood so again uh 
dumped here, but but not murdered here. Uh, something about this case that is interesting is that it, an object was inserted into Camara's vagina. Now, in looking at the body, I don't see any sign of that. There's no, there's no obvious uh, demarcation of mutilation or that. But that is something that that was noted: is that a, a, an object was inserted um, in her in her vagina. Um, some photos later on in the day. Um, uh, clearly, the snow by now is melted, and, and you can see the the tracks of the of the um, of the road. It's it's down to at this point in the day. Um, I think they arrived in the morning. It's it's just mud tracks now. That's Louis camera. Um, April 17th, 1977, so this is less than a month later from Cameron, uh, Jocelyn Houl, this is the case we just, we just talked about. So, um, th this is interesting, the, the, the placement of the body looks, um, in very ways, in many ways, very similar to Sharon Pryor, um, uh, in the, the, the positioning of the the, the legs and this might just be coincidence but there's they're, they're kind of crossed um, again a skirt so bare legs uh, shoes with socks socks rolled down um, to the ankle what appears to be a very um, a very long skirt she was wearing which is up to the knees uh, appears to be wearing a, a blouse and, and the purse is right adjacent to, to her. It's, in, in fact, it's, it, she's lying on her side, on her right side, and the purse is, is buttressed right up against her, her back. And the, to, to my view, the, the purse looks very similar to the, the Catherine Hawks purse, the, the, which was missing. This, her purse looks very similar. Um, so it's, it's, it's mid-April, but there's still snow on the ground, although it's clearly melting. Um, there, she's found off the road, gravel road, um, similar forest, uh, again, uh, young trees, uh, birch, but also some Christmas trees, what do you, like coniferous trees, I think. If, the, if that's the right word, I'm not really sure. Um, so that's uh, cool. So next, just just to note, June fourteenth, nineteen seventy-seven, Joanne uh, Desino disappears from Fabreville uh, and is never never seen again. Um, possible runaway, or she might have been murdered. She might have been never found. We just don't know. But if we're clocking a timeline, I just want to put that in there. Followed by July 9th, 1977, uh, Joanne Dorian, the case we discussed last night. Um, if you if you recall, uh, Dorian um, was taking the bus back from Sacré-Cœur Hospital, got off in Fabreville. Um, at the bus, her her eyeliner was found in the parking lot of the the snack bar. Um, Chez Laval or Chateau Laval, and her body is found um, in, a, again, a gravel road um, just adjacent to the, the river, kind of in the marshy swamp area. Um, so what I see here, and this is, um, you know, this is right in, as we said, in the, in the heat of the summer, and the body had been there for a month. Uh, I see a lot of underbrush. Um, you know, a lot of foliage, a lot of like thicket, uh, like twisting vines and stuff, and I can't even tell what I I'm seeing. I, I see a I see a foot and a leg, um, and a, a shoe. No sock. It's a what do you call that? Like a, a strapped shoe. I should have paid more. Um, attention to costume design, a strap shoe with like a clog high heel foot uh, um, on it. And uh, 
some articles of clothing, but I can't tell what it is. Uh, uh, forgive me, it looks like a, a body organ. I can't, I can't tell what that is. Um, again, as, as we know with, uh, with Dorian advanced, advanced decomposition, I mean, they couldn't even tell if she had been, been raped because the, the, the vag vaginal area was, was gone. Um, again, the photograph of the police detective holding with his bare hand the, the, the sleeve of her dress, which is absolutely covered in blood. And uh, some, some trees, but mostly just, just a few trees, not the big... Well, no, here's, here's what I see. I, she's found in this thicket, but right underneath, uh, uh, it's like three trees growing up together and out, and she's found right under it, right next to, uh, to the river. That's um, Joanne Dorian. July 29th, 1977, Chantal Tremblay, who we also discussed last night. Again, we don't, we don't know much about Tremblay because uh, she was found two years later. In, we know it's a wooded area. We know her clothing was found uh, five or six feet from the body, but you can only assume after two, two years that we were dealing with skeletal remains. Follow that with September 10th, 1977. You see that the timing of these things is starting to accelerate. Helen Monast. Monast, uh, again, the, the, this is in the little town of uh, Chambly. She, she left her, her work, which again was a, a, a snack bar, which is similar to the snack bar with Dorian. So makeup was, eyeliner was found. So she leaves the snack bar. She um, takes the canal road home, and, and she's found in, a, in a, a very small park. We used to call that a postage stamp park. Under, like a coniferous, I'm going to say coniferous again. I don't even know if that's right. Somebody can correct me. Like, I'll just call it a Christmas tree from now on, in, in like a grove of those. Um, from from Monast, uh, no signs of sperm. Uh, strangulation with a ligature. She's beaten severely about the face. She's found on her back. Uh, so these photos see very clearly on her back. Um, her hands are over her heads, palm, palm up. Uh, very detailed of her fingernails. Her, her fingernails, she, I think it was her birthday, and clearly she had done her nails very, very nicely. None of them are, appear to be ripped or torn, so she didn't, uh, maybe she didn't have a chance to struggle or to, to scratch. That, that certainly doesn't seem to have happened. Uh, around the scene, um, let's see, a styrofoam cup. Seems to be like a jean belt or something you'd use for your jeans to maybe to, to, to tie around you. Uh, yeah, in a grove of trees, most most definitely, I see that in that in that park. Um, and what else do we see here? Uh, a box of chiclets, a um, pack of uh, cigarettes, export a cigarettes. Um, that that is about all for. Uh, uh, Helen Monast. It's um, again, uh, well, no snow. Should mention that it's it's uh, uh, September by now. So, um, like like Dorian, um, this is the first uh, of three uh, Dorian, Tremblay, and Monast that are summer months. So 10 days later from Helen Monast, we have uh, September 20th, 1977, Catherine Hawks. This is uh, the victim who's found um, at the Cartierville uh, train station on the island of Montreal. I, d I don't have a, a crime scene 
photo of the body, although I do have a photo of the crime scene. Um, they did note that in hawks, the sperm is found in the in the vagina, so she was she was raped. Um, crime scene, so just adjacent to the uh, train station. So there's wooden stairs leading up to the train platform in the distance. A couple of telephone uh, poles, and in the foreground where the body was, um, I would call shrubs, thicket, not necessarily trees. It's just a couple of feet in from the sidewalk. Um, and it seems to be a lot of trash and debris there. There's a there's a, a wooden, looks like a, like a central support beam. What appears to be maybe some, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call walling? Uh, plaster or um, wallboard, uh, a brick, uh, a, lot of, a lot of debris in, this, in these, in these shrubs here, um, yeah, it just it just seems to be a, a thicket around and um, where she was found. It's concrete path leading up to the wooden stairs up to the train platform um, in Valdor, Cartierville. So that is Catherine Hawks. Next, we, we move um, a, a little over a month later to October 23rd, 1977, and the victim is Denise Bazinet. Recall that Bazinet uh, lived in the, the east end of Montreal, uh, near Saint-Denis, near um, Parc de la Fontaine. She worked at uh, saint Hubert Barbecue and uh, was last seen in the afternoon um, in, in that area was found less than 24 hours later in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu. Uh, um, the body was found down an embankment at um, a highway off-ramp, and that highway led north to the little town of uh, Chambly, where Helen Monast was, was found um, a, a little over a month earlier. So... Again, although it's uh, October 23rd, um, it's uh, late fall, there's no snow on the ground. She's found down this embankment, approximately, say, 12 to 16 feet. Um, the embankment's uh, bottom. Uh, beyond the embankment, is, it looks like a, like a grass or wheat field, uh, low, may, maybe... Uh, three to four feet high, and then beyond that, it looks like a, a field with a crop in it, possibly corn. No trees in this instance. Um, and then the, there's a visual on the body. Um, there's clearly a, a ligature mark around the neck. Uh, not manual, not hands, it's a ligature. Um, there's beating about the face. There's a bruise on the right temple. Um, there's a bloodied mark uh, around the right ocular region of right eye. Um, possible bloody nose. Earring on the left ear. Watch on the left um, hand. Um, what else do we see? Here, she's wearing uh, on her, let me see, what is that? On her right hand, she's wearing what appears to be an engagement ring on the, that, the engagement finger ring, and then a heart ring, a ring with a heart on her index finger, and on her left hand, um, she's wearing a ring with a, some kind of a jewel in it, so obviously the motive was not, was not robbery. That's for sure. Um, and uh, again, the earring, the watch. Quite a nice watch. Uh, not very feminine, looks like a very male in nature. Uh, so that is Denise uh, Bazinet. So we now move forward. Um, three months to January 23rd, 1978. Uh, the victim is Menon Dubé, 
10 to 12 years old, quite tall for her age. Um, recall she lived in Sherbrooke, Quebec. She was walking home um, around six o'clock with her sister and she disappeared. Um, body found approximately 10 miles south of Sherbrooke uh, near North Hatley on property that may have belonged to the family. And I'll describe that. I, I don't have a, I have a, a photo of the crime scene, so I'll describe that. There's a little, um, a little house, uh, modest um, house on the property, two windows on the side, front door. It looks like a front parlor window, but appears to be maybe two to three rooms, no upper level, maybe an attic at the upper level. Lots of snow. Um, recall she was found later, although she disappeared in January, she's found in March. Still lots of snow. Two picnic tables in the snow. There's there's clearing, and then there's a little stream. Dubé is found face down in the stream. She's fully clothed in her, in her snow clothes. The only article of clothing that appears to be missing is a mitten. And then on the other side of the, the stream, heavily wooded um, area. Now moving forward to the, the summer of 1978, June 3rd, 1978. We're now back on the uh, island of Montreal. The victim is uh, Lise Anglais. Remember, out out at the discos that night, um, presumably walks or maybe taking public transit home, is walking up the alley behind her house, opens the back gate to proceed down the pathways, is attacked somewhere in there. Um, she's, um, she's found lying on her left side. She's severely beaten. Uh, no sperm, no signs of rape. Uh, an object is, is used to beat her about the face. Um, corner says a rectangular ob object, possibly a brick or a large branch. Although the autopsy also says that the object was inserted into her vagina, and they know this because um, they found her own blood in her vagina, so they assume... Well, the, the object used to to bloody her about her face was also used to insert in her vagina. So something similar modus operandi is uh, Louise Camara there. And looking at the photo, uh, there's not much to go on. Um, garden path is gravel. Uh, rough bush on either sides of the garden path, uh, not a kept garden, very, looks like it hadn't been tended to in, in years, so rough grass, um, and the body's lying, it's covered in a tarpaulin, but it's, it's lying uh, across the path, it's on the side, a hand appears to be um, like over its head, over the body's head, and there's a large, um, wet, dark spot adjacent to the body, presumably a blood stain there. Finally, um, Teresa Lore, my, my sister's crime scene. Uh, I am going to describe this briefly and then um, get out of Dodge, because it isn't any fun. But uh, So... Um, this is November 3rd, 78, uh, but that's the date of disappearance. Uh, the body was found April 13th, 79, and I'm looking, looking at a crime scene photo from those five and a half months later. This is the longest period we've had that uh, the body, the, the point of disappearance and point of body identification has gone, is, is Teresa's case, five and a half months. Uh, and in saying that, you may say, well, was she, like some of the other victims, held captive for a while? And I wondered that for a while, too. And I, I can almost definitively say no, um, uh, because of a condition called, um, and I always get the pronunciation wrong on this, adiopusser, I believe that's how you pronounce it. 
And this is a condition that happens to a body that has been exposed to moisture and humidity for a prolonged period of time. The, the body um, becomes spongy, soap, soapy, bloated, uh, severely disfigured. Um, uh, and this is the case in, 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 in Teresa's case. And, and what that indicates is that it was not held somewhere else. It, it, it could only have become this way with a prolonged exposure to these conditions. So uh, lying face down in a body of water, very calm body of water. It's like a little, it's like a little um, culvert is all I can call it. Uh, it's not really a moving bodily body of water. It's, it's kind of what, what happens when, at, when the spring thaw happens, there's sort of a, it's like a little pond, overspill pond. So face down, uh, wearing underwear i can see the the brassiere and the um the underwear the panties um just adjacent to the shoreline which is a uh, farmer's field cornfield at that time um, although uh, wooded there's trees sort of um rising up but also falling they're sort of like dead trees that have fallen into the pond and in the distance we see the like a, a concrete little bridge um that crosses the road the water flows underneath it um, a lot of people have speculated that um, Teresa might have been thrown from the bridge into the pond and the body drifted I, what's problematic about that is um where her scarf was found was found in the field. If you, if you imagine in your mind a triangular area with the, the points being the bridge to the body in the water and then the final point of the triangle would be um, uh, across the field out to the road again. Um, and that cross, that dissecting side of the triangle that crosses the field to the road the scarf was found in two pieces along that diagonal um, and there were bruises under the armpits so you presume the body was um, was dragged to this location um, that was what i always thought that was the conclusion of a Sarté de quebec investigator early in the investigation eric latour concluded that as well um, and then again, I'm, I'm looking at a spring picture, but this was obviously, um, well, it wasn't winter. Um, November 3rd was a unusually sunny day and it had not, snow had not fall, fallen, but it was fall. So I'm going to get out of there. That's enough of that. Teresa Moore. So some things that, that I, I noticed, um, in kind of mapping this, uh, chronologically um, so we 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 start in Montreal but quickly move to Sherbrooke with Louise Camara and then we have a lot of Montreal activity and then we, we end up um, at the end of 78 uh, or beginning and and end end of 78 Menon du Bay trees back in the Sherbrooke region don't know if that means anything um, we get a high concentration of violent activity um, beginning in sort of the spring of 77 right up to October 77. That's where the most clustered activity happens and, and that activity happens in, in the Montreal area. Um, something that struck me this time around and looking at this is... Um, uh, the similarity of the dump sites, um, gravel roads, um, wooded areas, in some cases body bodies of water, some secluded dump sites, um, trees, groves of trees. Even when a victim like Dorian is, is found kind of in a marsh, she's found right under a tree. 
Um, same with Teresa, and, uh, my sister, uh, next to a, next to a, like a field, but there's this little grove of trees. Um, it's not the case with Bazine. Bazine is wide in the open, but um, and, and then again, a, a, um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, strangulation mixes it up. Sometimes uh, there's stabbing. Um, um, you know, I wouldn't um, understand that. Uh, you know, offenders. People think serialists and offenders, and they think, okay, one thing. You know, it's always one weapon, and it's it's always one type of location. It's you know, it's this very strict modus operandi. Understand that violent offenders um, can mix it up and and improvise as well, right? Depending on the conditions, uh, an event might happen in the course of what they've planned on that forces them to change strategies or tactics. One victim might be more compliant and, and another one might be quite resistant, causing them to be more violent physically with blows, etc. cetera. Um, something to think about. And then something we've talked about a little bit is um, the difference between um, uh, a trick, a ruse, where somebody's, somebody's sent into confusion or possibly um, uh, tricked into getting into a vehicle, um, I, I cite that as possibilities with Sharon Pryor, Louise Cameron, um, possibly Jocelyn Hull, um, possibly Chant Chantel Tremblay, um, possi um, definitely uh, Denise Bazinet, definitely Manon Dubé, definitely Teresa Lor, as opposed to the Blitz, the attack, something out of the blue. Uh, um, more kind of disorganized approach as opposed to the, the planning approach of, of, of the, the trick or ruse. So in the, the Blitz case, I would cite, um, let's see, uh, possibly jo Jocelyn Houle, um, definitely Joanne Dorian, uh, possibly Chantelle Tremblay, uh, probably Helen Monast, definitely Catherine Hawkes, uh, definitely les en play in those situations. Um, so those are, you know, each time I have a go around at this, I, I, uh, something else strike strikes me, but that's what's struck me this time. And then again, as we started at the beginning, just the diminutive nature of the majority of these victims, um, victims that would have been very easy to to overpower. But perhaps you see something different. Um, and, you know, if anyone is out there is, is an expert in these things, is a, in the field of criminology or psychology, or, um, um, I certainly would, would be open to anyone's suggestions or, or opinions or advice. Uh, we have, um, you know, it's a 24-hour clock, uh, I've discovered with this podcast, um, Sometimes you, you you try to plan on the, the best time of day to release these things. You know, I know news organizations always do this. In this case, it doesn't matter because somebody's listening all the time. I'm, I'm still kind of amazed that we have listeners all over the globe from all kinds of countries. Just <laughs> uh, really, it, 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 it frankly delights me. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really cool. So maybe you have something... And, uh, to contribute, I'd love your opinions on this, because I can't crack it. Maybe you can. Um, and you know where to reach me. Or if you don't, I'll tell you at the end of the show uh, how to do that. So um, that's, geez, I, I kind of feel like I need to shake it off now, you know. It's, it's kind of an intense one. Um, but I think that's enough for this week. Uh, as I said, I... Had the opportunity to get a quick episode in. I wanted to do it because there's a there's a good chance I might have to go radio silent for a little bit with a project I'm working on. Um, but um, in closing, I wanted to give give a hurrah. Um, last night's episode on uh, Joan Dorian 
That's the fastest we've climbed to a thousand listeners in 24 hours. We actually got a thousand listeners within 24 hours for that episode. So, hey, brava, brava to uh, listeners and to us. That's great. Again, I'm really happy. And, you know, I, I can look at statistics here and see, um, again, it amazes me. Uh, Melbourne, Australia this week is the number one listener. I don't know why. Um, but I think it's cool. Followed by Toronto, so little little love from the, from Canada, always appreciated. San Francisco, uh, Magnolia, Texas, Tempe, Arizona, Portland, Oregon, Chicago, Henderson, Nevada, Vancouver, Canada. Hey again, hey hello Vancouver, Minneapolis, Durek, Australia. Never heard of that. Um, Durham, North Carolina. Hey, that's that's where I work. Luton, United Kingdom. Uh, Preston, UK, Stockholm, Sweden, um, Brisbane, Australia. Uh, it's great. I, I, it's, it's just great. And uh, I guess a shout out to the number one listener this week, um, Murray, who's clearly been uh, binge listening. boy, uh, Murray. Glad to have you aboard. So, um, again, I'll post this on my website, although... There's, there's not much to add to this episode this week um, that isn't already on my website, but that's at www.theresalore.com. Uh, if you go to the, the initial pages in French and English, I have the chronological order of these cases if you want more details on them. Certainly there, there's much more there than I've discussed in this episode for you to go over. If you wanted to get into details of who the investigators were, who performed the autopsies, exact heights and weights uh, of victims. It's, it's all there um, for you to uh, peruse. Um, if you want to contact me, um, that's at TeresaLore at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-R-E-S-A at uh, gmail.com for tips, suggestions, advice, um, suggestions on future shows, that kind of thing. And I'm also on the Twitter. On Twitter, you you can find me at Justice Guy at J O S T U S um, G. <laughs> That's not it. Hang on. All right, reset. At Justice Guy at J U S T U S G U Y. Um, and then finally, um, if you need a visual, want to see who killed Teresa in action, walking, talking. Um, that's on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and uh, search on Teresa Lore, you can find news magazine shows um, that cover a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about. <clears throat> All right. I've talked enough. That's enough. Uh, thank you so much for listening this week and have a great evening. This is Who Killed Teresa? Good night.